you know, I'm super excited to be here. Also a little terrified after Ricky's introduction. I feel like he set a very high bar with his remarks. I will do my best to, uh, to meet that bar. So I want to talk with you all today about the war on drugs in rural Appalachia, conceptualizing its escalation, um, and also analyzing its impacts on Appalachians who use drugs. And I do want to just note we have a couple of chat. Uh, I don't know if we need to pick if anyone's having yeah, trouble hearing. Okay, lovely, lovely, lovely. So <laughs> there are, um, you know, as with any study, there are always different ways of kind of telling the stories. I want to experiment with one way, might fail utterly. I came up with telling the story this way this morning and had a panic attack. So is this a good idea? I don't know. But I'm going to kind of hang or scaffold the story around two different slides. Um, and this is this is the first one here. So um, if you focus for now just on the solid lines, right? So those are depicting um, jail and prison-based incarceration rates in 12 Appalachian, 22 Appalachian counties, right? They're at the heart of the opioid epidemic in the U.S. Um, these counties are overwhelmingly white, so about 95% of the residents in these rural Appalachian counties are white, according to census data. One note, um, I pulled these data from the Vera incarceration database. Are you all familiar with that? I see some people nodding. That is just a gold mine because what they did was they got, I don't know how, the uh, home addresses of people before they were incarcerated. And so the incarceration rate data that they share at the county level is actually for people's home addresses, not the facilities. Oh. And this, I know, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so that matters so much if you're setting rural areas because a lot of our prisons are located in rural areas, but they have urban residents. Mm -hmm. So what Vera has done is transformative for us in this particular sector. Um, and I, you know, I created this chart after holding a series of meetings with community members in 12 of the counties that you see here. And I held these meetings um, as a part of a care, the Care to Hope project. I'll talk about it later. I get to co-lead it with April Young. Um, and we were holding a series of meetings in those 12 counties um, with people who use drugs and also with people who were organizing and running harm reduction programs. And our main question was, was, you know, what are the barriers and facilitators to harm reduction locally? And something kept happening in those meetings that like did not make any sense to me. Um, we would ask about the most pressing barriers to harm reduction and people kept telling us about high incarceration rates. So I would like, you know, at first I would kind of nod politely and I would try to move the conversation on to another topic because it seemed so unlikely that these tiny predominantly white communities in rural Appalachia would have high incarceration rates. Because we, you know, we all know that the US war on drugs is designed as kind of an arm of white supremacy and racialized capitalism. And it is designed to, um, you know, create uh, and perpetuate those systems through terrorizing black communities and other kind of BIPOC communities. So that's how I have understood the war on drugs in this country. Um, so like, honestly, like any good scientist, when I was hearing these stories about something that didn't kind of jive with my understanding, I like ran away. Did not want to hear anything <laughs> more that, right? Like what? Um, it, <laughs> so, uh, but, but to their credit, the people in these meetings kept bringing us back to these high incarceration rates. And so finally, April and I relented, we put aside our skepticism, and we turned to Vera's data and we created first the slide that only had the solid lines, right? And as you can see, there are in fact like pretty large increases over time. We have jail and prison-based incarceration rates, 1990 to 2018. Um, and you can see that there's like a pretty steep rise across time, right? These are in those, the, 12 counties where we were working and then 10 additional ones they'll tell you about in a, in a moment. Now I tend to have a hard time like thinking about quantitative data like this without some kind of comparison. Like I need to understand scale. 
Um, and so I pulled the same incarceration data again from Vera, but this time for the 12 most populous US counties, right? So that would be LA County, Cooks County, Fulton County, New York County. Um, these are counties that are urban and actually have much lower percentages of white residents, right? And so then I plotted those, those are the dark lines, right? And so what is kind of remarkable to me to see, it may not be remarkable to you, but to me it was really um, just a moment that took my breath away is that you actually see, so those are the dotted lines, you actually see crossovers in jail and prison-based incarceration rates across these rural and urban areas in like 2007 to 2010, depending on what you're looking at. Um, and then you have the, you know, after the crossover, you see that the rates in those populous urban counties kind of decline or stay static, but they, they continue to rise right, in the predominantly white Appalachian counties. Um, and I know I heard someone say, hmm, right. So that was, that I think to me was a transformative moment for me. Um, and um, so, you know, I did not have a way to kind of understand how we got to this place. And so part of what I wanna talk about with you today is how this happened, right? How do we understand this? So then the second slide that I want to kind of share with you and that I want to scaffold the, the kind of discussion about today is this. So this is a traditional table, right? Regression results. And what we did, we had a sample of uh, almost a thousand people who were white using drugs in those 22 Appalachian areas. We were trying to understand the relationship between different criminal legal encounters that we, that we associate with the war on drugs and a measure of unmet need for medical care, right? Almost, and actually this is an, an exclusively white sample of people who use drugs in Appalachia. And what you can see is that we don't find in our adjusted relationships, we actually don't find an association. And so this is really uh, flies in the face of several decades of work on the war on drugs and uh, you know, healthcare use and, and the health of people who use drugs in the counties and neighborhoods where the war on drugs was first formulated, right? So in predominantly black neighborhoods, yeah. Are you women and men? Yeah, 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 yeah. Women and men. Because I would think of pregnant women who use and yeah. get thrown into the criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, and that others must not be there, but they're there, so that's not happening. Yeah, it's very. Um, the, this null finding, I think, to me, was one of those moments where as a scientist, I needed to dig deeper. I needed to listen um, to like potentially contrary evidence and understand um, what might be happening, right? Um, and so this for me is the second slide that I want to be hanging the talk around is why might we have a null relationship here when decades of research in the communities um, where the war on drugs was first founded, we actually see that criminal legal encounters are quite detrimental to a range of drug-related harms and also health services among like people who use drugs. Okay. Um, do people usually like stop and have questions here? Well, just questions I just talk. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So what I want to do today. Is, no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm <happy. laughs> that is fine. I just wasn't sure what you all usually do. So, um, <laughs> um, so this is really what I want to talk about today, right? Under, how do we conceptualize the war on drugs in predominantly white Appalachian counties? Then, you know, the table that you all saw a minute ago that came from a study out of the rural opioid initiatives. I want to tell you about that study. And then I, I want to try to understand and unpack that null relationship that we found between these different kinds of criminal legal encounters and unmet needs for medical care among these uh, white Appalachians. Um, I am, you know, so I want to be clear uh, I am responsible for any kind of ridiculous things that I say today, but I do have amazing collaborators because I have found trying to dig into these topics incredibly challenging. And so I've been able to call on amazing colleagues at Emory 
Chandra Ford, Ali Sewell, Natalie Crawford, Leslie Salas Hernandez. And these are people whose names you may know very well. They're really at the forefront of trying to understand racialized capitalism and trying to understand the role of criminal legal systems and perpetuating that. Um, and then because we're also working in Appalachia, I get to work with people who are at the kind of forefront and trying to understand the determinants of drug related harms among white Appalachians. And so that would be um, April Young and also J uh, Judith Weinberg and a few other people. Um, before I go into kind of my, my remarks, one thing I wanna be, I don't know, I wanna just issue kind of a word of caution um, and, and this is kind of centered on another image that I know you can't see right now, so I'll kind of um, translate it. So this is a, a kind of gravestone from a man named Mr. Joseph Stewart. Um, and just to summarize what it says, this, uh, what, it said, what it says on his stone, it says that uh, he was born into slavery and then he freed himself from a Mr. Cooper um, in New York State in the 1800s. He died about 20 years later. Um, he was one of many, many people that my family enslaved across generations. We did that in New York State. We did that in Virginia. We did that in Turks and Caicos. We did that in many other places. So because of this biography, and the way that it shapes my present, it's really, really important that you listen to me today with some skepticism, right? So I'm you know, committed to making reparations for my family's legacy and its ongoing impacts. Um, but just know that I have a vested interest in perpetuating white supremacy and racialized capitalism because I'm gonna lose power and wealth when those systems fall, right? So for the next few minutes, while I'm talking to you about racialized capitalism, and white supremacy, I ask that you listen to me critically, right? So ask yourself what I am unable to see because I'm so invested in these systems, um, what I might hide or what I might distort in service to these systems, okay? Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so uh, let's, let's kind of go to uh, that first topic, right? So um, you know, the war on drugs um, and uh, Appalachia. And I'm going to kind of go through some of the, the beginnings of this quite rapidly because I'm going to assume that we all understand how the war on drugs has operated in the communities where it first was developed, right? Yes, I'm seeing people nod, all right. Um, so, you know, as we all know, uh, the war on drugs was developed um, after the fall of Jim Crow to sustain white supremacy and racialized capitalism um, by attempting to decimate the political, economic, and social capital within Black communities. I'm going to be talking very specifically about Black communities, recognizing that uh, the war on drugs also targets many other BIPOC communities, but I want to be really, I think the impacts are nuanced according to kind of where you sit. So I want to be quite precise. I'll be talking about black communities and white communities. Um, now, when I use the term white supremacy, I'll be using the term white supremacy and racialized capitalism. And I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page, at least as how I, under, how I understand it. So here I'm gonna rely on Martinez's definition, which is that white supremacy is a historically based, institutionally perpetuated system of exploitation and oppression of continents, nations, and peoples of color by white people and nations of the European continent in order to maintain and defend a system of wealth, power, and privilege right, that, acc that accrues to white people. Um, for racialized capitalism, the definition that I've been using is that it establishes and reinforces the highly differentiated racialized landscapes that are required to maximize white profit. These landscapes are sharpened along intersecting hierarchies of labor, owner, rural, urban, gender, and other dimensions of social position. All right, so that's kind of how I'm understanding those two terms. So, you know, Reagan rededicated the U.S. to the war on drugs back in 1981, and this war has been characterized ever since by high levels of policing in urban, predominantly Black neighborhoods. It's also been characterized by relentless stop and frisks that were conducted to find drugs and by high rates of arrest, which then, of course, lead to mass incarceration. Um, and, you know, this is what mass what racialized mass incarceration looks like. So here we have the incarceration rate among urban Black residents compared to their white counterparts over time. You can see that the incarceration rates, rate for whites is pretty consistently about 12% that for Black people. Um, war on drug strategies uphold racialized capitalism very, very effectively. 
Mass incarceration, for example, undermines Black social, economic, and political power and capital by shutting incarcerated people out of the job market, disenfranchising them, and then threatening the ties that bind them to their families, to their friends and communities. And of course, when all of this unfolds on a massive scale, it also disrupts uh, resources and capital within their broader communities that they're embedded within. Um, a couple of, I think, really crucial points here. Um, and one of the things that we have learned from several decades of advocacy and work around the war on drugs um, is that it's part of an unbroken chain of state-sponsored criminal legal interventions that have been kind of made into the lives of Black people and Black communities, right? And it started with slave patrols and that morphed into lynchings, Black codes and chain gangs, and then into uh, Jim Crow and now, of course, into the war on drugs. And um, this, uh, you know, this is, I think, a highly effective strategy that teaches us our social position within this racialized system. So it teaches all of us that part of the daily reality of race for Black people is constantly having one's sovereignty over oneself, one's family, and one's community under attack. And it's a constant reminder to me as a white person of my own unthreatened sovereignty over myself, my family, and my community. Um, it's a perpetual system, I think. So it's one that's not triggered by a particular uprising, though of course it can be amplified in response to an uprising as needed. Um, and one kind of crucial feature, I think, is that it unfolds within a broader context of ongoing state-sponsored um, attacks um, against political, social, and economic rights. And these are attacks that we perpetuate through a host of different policies and practices, All right, So that is, in a nutshell, like several decades of advocacy here around the war on drugs in urban areas. So I think a key question is, what is it doing in these 12 Appalachian counties, right, that are predominantly white? And I want to reject two explanations off the bat. I want to reject the, the explanation that Appalachian white people are, are only marginally white. Are you familiar with this kind of trope? Right. So there is this kind of um, idea that um, Appalachians are, are not truly white and that that has kind of allowed the war on drugs to, to kind of flourish in that area. What I will say is that, in fact, this is my rejection. <laughs> Um, is that whiteness evolves, right? The boundaries of whiteness are always, uh, you know, changing. And, um, you know, they're changing in response to the agencies of capitalism. So there was indeed a time in the early 1900s, about a century ago, when Appalachians were framed as a distinct primitive race, right? But that period has passed, right? That was about a century ago. Whiteness is solidified to include Appalachians. Right. So when Irish people went through a similar evolution. No one today would look at someone who was Irish and say that they're not white. Right. So the boundaries of whiteness evolve. So I'm going to reject the idea that Appalachians are being targeted by the war on drugs because they're not white. I also want to reject the idea that race is irrelevant in Appalachia because so many people who live there are white. So this is a very common kind of idea in Appalachian studies that because most people who live in rural Appalachia are white, race is therefore irrelevant, right? And to me, I think that, put the X through that too. Um, so, you know, I think that that is a pernicious fallacy, right? That kind of holds up whiteness as this referent group, as this norm. Um, and so let's just put that aside. We're not gonna entertain that. What I and my really amazing colleagues, I think are trying to do is to conceptualize the war on drugs in Appalachia through the lens of racialized capitalism, through the lens of white supremacy. And we're trying to understand that it is constructing race and class in this region, just as it has been doing and been so essential to the construction of race and class in the predominantly black urban neighborhoods where it was first created, right? Where it was first deployed. It's just that the race and the class that the war on drugs is creating in Appalachia, they're different, right, from the race and class that's being created in the community of origin. Does that make sense? Okay, lovely. So I'm gonna spend some time making this point because I think that it matters. And I think it matters because we in public health, and I hold myself accountable here too, we need to start thinking about how white supremacy and racialized capitalism shape the lives and the health of white people. Right. right now, I think our work in health equity and justice 
we're conceptualizing these systems as determinants of BIPOC lives and health alone, right? But we know in fact that these systems are totalizing, right? They touch all of us by design. They shape all of us. So we're not going to eliminate health inequities. We're not going to achieve health justice until we recognize this unified reality, right? Until we start to analyze how white supremacy and racialized capitalism affect white people and also our health. Okay, so that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, okay, so how to kind of understand the war on drugs as an engine of white supremacy and racialized capitalism in Appalachia. I'm gonna follow the lead of some of the amazing work that's been done on the war on drugs in, in cities, and I'm gonna go back into history. Sophia was on my dissertation committee with Nancy Krieger, who's like, of course, I have to go back to history. So I'm going to go back to history. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at historical patterns of criminal legal deployments in the Appalachian region, one thing that becomes really apparent is that they occurred when local working class white people were trying to keep some of the wealth that they created, right? The, the function of Appalachia in the US economy has always been to serve as a resource, right? That could be pillaged by upper class white people in cities and then translated into urban white wealth, right? So that is how kind of Appalachia has functioned in the US economically. And whenever Appalachians tried had uprisings to try to keep some of the profits that they generated for themselves that would threaten this essential system. Um, and it would trigger these criminal legal deployments, all right? And these deployments have three features that I want to raise up. So they're rare, right? They're time limited and they unfold in a broader context in which white Appalachians continue to reap the benefits of white supremacy. So those are kind of three things I'm gonna be walking you through. So, you know, to the best of my knowledge, and I want to say I am not a historian, okay, but to the best of my knowledge, and after checking with some people who are historians, um, it seems like there have been two major deployments of state-sponsored criminal legal terror against white Appalachians before the war on drugs, and the first is the Whiskey Rebellion. Does anybody remember the Whiskey Rebellion? Yes. Well, remember. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Aware of. Aware of. Very good. Um, and, and the second would be the coal mining wars, which I'm sure you know people are familiar with. So the Whiskey Rebellion, it happened in uh, 1794 when white Appalachians were riding against uh, Hamilton's whiskey tax, right? So the region had a barter economy at the time, and this barter economy threatened capitalism in the new republic, right? So we all like currency has to exist. Um, as a precondition for capital accumulation because it separates value from labor, right? Um, and so if you want to accumulate wealth or capital, you have to be able to use currency to separate value from labor. Um, but these, this was an area where, of course, they were continuing the border. Hamilton was not all singing and dancing. I love yeah. Hamilton, <laughs> but in fact, he created much of the kind of capitalist structures that are painful for us today. Um, so uh, he mandated that the whiskey tax be paid in US dollars, right? To try to force Appalachians, very intentionally to try to force Appalachians out of bartering and into capitalism's orbit. They didn't like it, so they revolted. And Washington deployed 12,000 troops to enforce this tax. And that marks the very first domestic deployment of the US military against white citizens. So the Cold Wars are the second deployment. And this is probably something that you're a lot more familiar with. So these wars were waged sporadically between 1819 and 1930, when miners were striking repeatedly um, to keep the greater share of the profits that they generated. And mining companies at the time, they allied with state and federal governments to squash these rebellions. And the ensuing actions often precipitated really brutal battles. So one example would be um, the Battle of Blair Mountain, which I keep wanting to call the Blair Witch. I think <laughs> that's not, that's not it. Um, in that battle, so there were 3,000 law enforcement officers that joined with the National Guard to squash an uprising of 10,000 people, right? And they killed about 100 Appalachians. So yes, there is a history of deployments against white people in the region. Um, but they're rare, right? Look at this 
attempt at a timeline. So they're, they're quite rare, right? They're also initiated very specifically to squash uprisings in which white Appalachians are trying to retain some of the wealth that they're creating, right? Instead of allowing it to be exported um, off to upper class people in the cities. Um, and because I think they were initiated in response to specific challenges, these deployments are also their time limit. Right, they end when the threat to racialized capitalism ends. So troops left the area after the Whiskey Rebellion subsided, right? And, and they also left when mining strikes abated, although that, that abatement took more time. Um, I also wanna note that these, both of these deployments against white Appalachians occurred in a broader context in which whiteness continued to yield benefits for them. So, you know, during the U.S.'s early years, whiteness manifested as the power to expropriate land from Native nations and for land-owning men, it also manifested in the right to vote. Um, white Appalachians around the time of the Whiskey Rebellion were actively seizing Native lands and, and men were then leveraging that colonized land to qualify for the, for the kind of enfranchisement. Um, Appalachians whites also, you know, during the time of the Cold Wars, um, were protected from other major events happening at the time, like Black Codes lynchings and the ongoing violent expropriation of indigenous lands, right? So their whiteness protected them from that terrorizing. Um, and so it seems to me and my colleagues that the war on drugs in the region really needs to be understood within the history of these two prior deployments. So just as we try to understand the war on drugs in predominantly black urban communities, um, uh, in its historical context, right, is this kind of unbroken chain. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves, like what is happening maybe economically in Appalachia now that might threaten racialized capitalism and provoke the current criminal legal response that is the, the war on drugs. Um, and then also how maybe is white supremacy continuing to operate? Are we going to see this pattern happening again? Um, so let's just turn first to what's happening in this region economically. So this is a region that's really been transformed over the past few decades into what's called the sacrifice zone of organized abandonment. Um, that's a term that I learned. It's very, I, I find it actually a really useful framework for understanding Appalachia. So sacrifice zones are characterized by a descent from being a productive essential engine of the economy to being kind of an exhausted peripheral remnant. They're characterized by economic immiseration of the populace. And they're also characterized by environmental degradation. So for centuries, Appalachia was heralded as essential to US urbanization and industrialization. So its salt mines preserved the food that sustained workers in emerging cities. Its timber and coal fueled US factories, right? So it really was the engine of the US economy. By now though, its resources have been exhausted through centuries of extraction, or they've been rendered peripheral because factories have migrated overseas. And so, and this resource extraction that happened across centuries has also precipitated ecologic devastation. So I don't know if you follow this in the news, but Kentucky and other Appalachian counties are routinely experiencing what's called a hundred year floods. We have to change that term because actually these are happening now every couple of years. They're also dealing with contaminated land and water. Um, because there's no vibrant economic sector in the region anymore, the median household in income for Appalachian rural counties is about two thirds that of the US median. Um, debt payments are primary ways that residents of sacrifice zones participate in the 21st century economy, right? And because uh, employment rates are quite low um, and debt burdens are far higher in rural Appalachia than they are elsewhere in the US. Um, sacrifice zones, they tend to get really restive, right? We can't tolerate economic immiseration or ecologic devastation for very long. Um, and it's really important, I think, to the stability of our current stage of racialized capitalism that these Appalachian sacrifice zones remain quiescent, like that they remain somehow tamed. Um, war on drug strategies are like they're exquisitely suited to controlling residents of sacrifice zones, um, whether those sacrifice zones are rural or urban. 
So drug related policing, um, it has to be highly proactive to detect street level drug activity because the people who are possessing drugs, who are buying, who are selling drugs, they're not going to be calling the police on themselves, right? So you need to have a very active police force kind of that's highly intrusive. Also, police stops that are trying to find drugs have to be incredibly invasive because most people, if they're carrying drugs at all, it's quite a small quantity. So these have to be highly invasive searches um, that the police do. Um, and when they're combined with mass incarceration, each of these strategies, the stop and searches, the arrests, the kind of incarceration, they dismantle the individual family and community resources that are needed to facilitate resident mobilization. Right, so that's why we see war on drug strategies deployed often in sacrifice zones. And that's not just true um, in the US, it's also true globally, right? We export a lot of our policing strategies and we have exported a lot. We've exported war on drug strategies in particular um, to cities and rural areas globally um, where the government is trying to control local residents. So I think that you know we are seeing the expansion of the war on drugs into this region um, as a you know as a kind of critical way that we've deployed criminal legal interventions to teach people about their race and their class in the region, right? And and here in particular, I think there's a maybe an attempt to to ensure that these rest of regions remain quiet. Um, I also want to note that you know a very important difference from the urban areas where the war on drugs first started um, is that, that we continue to see the benefits of white supremacy flowing into these Appalachian counties, right? So there's this, the war on drugs is accompanied, right, by ongoing benefits from white supremacy. Um, so just, you know, one example of many is the Appalachian Regional Commission, right? You guys familiar with the Appalachian Regional Commission? It, it you know, funds, it's a federally designated um, agency um, that is designed economic support to the area, um, and it has funneled billions of dollars into the region. Um, and this is a resource that's all about whiteness, right? So in the kind of Mississippi Delta region, which is also very rural, also economically devastated and predominantly black, people have advocated repeatedly for a parallel federal agency to support the residents and they lose every single time, right? And there, there's a you know clear, if you look at the efficacy to set up that new region, people are invoking the Appalachian Regional Commission as a model and continuing to kind of get turned down, right? So I just want to note that there continue to be billions of dollars coming into this region through that federal commission. Um, and to me, I, I do interpret that as another manifestation of the way that white supremacy supports people in the midst of the, the war on drugs. There are many other examples. Um, so then I want to, um, whoops, huh, okay. Um, so then I had, was supposed to have a slide of the two, the four incarceration lines. Just imagine that that's what you're seeing up there. <laughs> um, so, Just try and think about where to go next. All right, so let me kind of move on now to the Rural Opioid Initiative, which is um, the, the study, it's a multi-site study that generated the tables that I shared earlier, the null results, right, between different measures of criminal legal encounters and unmet need for healthcare. Um, so the Rural Opioid Initiative is funded by multiple DHHS agencies and also the Appalachian Regional Commission. And it's designed to describe and intervene in epidemics of drug-related harms in rural areas. And it includes eight sites. Now here, I'm gonna be drawing on the uh, Rural Opioid Initiative's four Appalachian sites. And those four sites span Kentucky, they span West Virginia, Ohio, and North Carolina. And all of those counties are part of the Appalachians as defined by the Appalachian Regional Commission. I have the pleasure of co-leading this project with my wonderful colleague, April Young, who's on faculty at the University of Kentucky. Um, and uh, between 2018 and 2020, 
each rural opioid initiative site used respondent-driven sampling to recruit um, adults who use drugs in these 22 Appalachian counties, right? So we harmonize recruitment methods across the counties. We also harmonize eligibility criteria. Um, Respondent-driven sampling was used to create the samples. And we um, developed harmonized surveys that were administered by trained interviewers um, and people got incentives. There's a range of incentives here because different sites chose to offer different incentive uh, amounts. Among the many measures that we administered in these surveys were measures of criminal legal encounters in the past six months. So we covered stop and frisk, we covered arrest, incarceration, probation and parole. And sometimes in these slides, you'll see that I'm using the term community supervision. And I use those terms interchangeably, probation and parole and community supervision. Um, we also had a measure of unmet need for medical care in the past six months. So this was a composite measure um, in which uh, if anyone answered affirmatively to any one of these 12 reasons for missing medical care, we noted that they uh, had, had kind of an unmet need for medical care in the past six months. Um, in terms of our analysis, we regress the overall measure of unmet need for care on those four measures of criminal legal encounters. We use prevalence ratios because the outcome was quite common. We controlled for a bunch of possible confounders. And we, of course, accounted for recruitment chains and also for uh, the site where the data were collected. Um, and you know, go, we also brought in quite a lot of existing administrative data to try to describe the areas where people lived. You've already used some of that administrative data to generate the chart that you see here, and I've just circled the crossover dates. Um, we were gathering data um, 2018 to 2020, so just after um, the end of, of the chart. Let me describe the sample. We restricted almost all of the participants um, were identifying as non-Hispanic white. We eliminated about 10% of the, of the participants who did not. And I wanna come back to that in a little bit. We ended up with a sample of just shy of, of 1,000 people. Um, as you can see from, from the slide, um, this was a, a you know, group of people um, who were deeply impoverished, right? So we had rates of um, uh, people reporting being unhoused. Uh, in the past, I think it was 30 days um, of about 41 or 42 percent, which was high. Yes, thank so you. Clarify. Yeah, so you can ask those questions. You have, you're driving from each county. Yeah. Should we assume that it's fairly evenly like the border of the Southern people in each county, or, or is it? Good question. I think that. Um, it was relatively evenly distributed across the sites, right? I don't know about across counties. Yeah, yeah. If this would be atmosphere sampling, how were they experiencing homelessness? So can you see that at the beginning? Is this a sample that was generated through atmosphere sampling? Uh, yeah, so we were using respondent-driven sampling. Respondent-driven sampling. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so going through networks yeah. um, and uh, we were, you know, selecting seeds from, uh, you know, sometimes from local syringe service programs. April and I did a whole lot of cookouts, so I'm very good at uh, barbecuing. I'm a vegetarian, but I can now make a mean hamburger patty. Um, and uh, what else? How else did people recruit? I think through different social service agencies as well. Yeah, yeah. So that was how we got the seeds, and then it was respondent-driven sampling after that. Yeah, questions? They can be clarifying or not. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so the sample was, you know, quite impoverished. Um, and uh, as you, you know, might imagine, given the incarceration rates that you can see from the administrative data from Vera, um, rates of criminal legal encounters were quite high, right? So we have about 44% of the sample reporting that they've been stopped and searched. Um, in the past six months, um, and then rates of arrest, incarceration, and community supervision range between about 27% and about 31%, so, you know, quite, quite high. Um, unmet need for care. Through this 
particular measure um, was also hurting us. So we have about 69% um, of the sample reporting some kind of unmet need for care. Well, you know, I think are those they are, but do you want them now? Oh, are there questions or so they can it's not about hearing or anything. It's no, uh, okay. well, they can't hear the questions in the audience. So oh, so I should repeat them. Should I repeat them? them? Yeah. Okay. But there are two questions we can. Oh, oh, wait, I don't know what time it is. It's 12.50. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, so uh, I'll try to wrap this up in about five minutes. Um, so yes, very high rates of unmet need for medical care, unable to pay was a leading cause, um, transportation was another, um, and then also people reported quite a lot of concern about you know, fear of mistreatment from the medical uh, professionals. This is what you saw earlier, so no relationship. So we have a lot of reports of criminal legal engagement. We have a, you know, high rates of unmet need for care, but those two things are not related in this sample. Um, and you know, this really flies in the face of several decades of research on criminal legal encounters um, and health and healthcare use among people who use drugs. That Ricky has done quite a lot of that work. Um, and so I think a key question for us is why? Um, and, you know, past research in urban areas has posited that psychological distress may be a key pathway linking criminal legal encounters and unmet need for health care. Um, clearly, the encounter in and of itself can be um, quite uh, jarring and, and can cause a lot of anxiety. But we also know through qualitative research in the urban counties where um, drugs policing was first launched, that um, the meaning of these encounters matters tremendously. People really understand the, the encounters with the police, um, with the criminal legal system as being very freighted um, with discrimination, right? It's really com coming from structural discrimination and that then exacerbates the distress. One thing, uh, then a couple of other pathways that have come out are that criminal legal encounters create significant financial burdens, right? And also something called procedural hassles. So procedural hassles are having to, you know, report to your probation officer, having to provide a whole lot of, of paperwork, which we tend to underestimate, but can really impact whether or not people can meet other obligations, perhaps also including um, uh, getting care. One thing that we've been putting forth, my colleagues and I are trying to understand this, is that we may not see that relationship between criminal legal exposures and unmet need for care because those encounters with the criminal legal system are not so freighted with discrimination. So the meaning is different, right, in, in Appalachia. Um, it's also the case that Appalachia, that at least in the 22 counties where we've been working, um, that in fact, people have very, very strong networks, social networks, and those social networks may be able to provide key informational, instrumental, financial, maybe even emotional support to break that pathway um, to unmet need for care. And this to me is um, one thing I'll say really quickly is that in the counties where the war on drugs was first launched, those were also counties where there was serial displacement among residents for the past century, right? So gentrification, um, you know, uh, urban renewal, public housing relocations, all of that was sedimented on top of 40 years of mass incarceration. And those initiatives were designed in part to disrupt these networks, right? People in uh, the white Appalachians um, in the counties where we're working, they have not experienced that. So this is where whiteness is protective. They have these networks that have built up in place across generations. And those networks um, may be helping to break possible causal pathways between the war on drugs and unmet need for healthcare. So, you know, just a couple of thoughts. From, from my perspective, I think a really essential next step for efforts to attain health equity is that we have to start systematically analyzing how white supremacy and racialized capitalism affect the lives and the health of white people, right? And we don't have, like, we don't have to do this kind of de novo. I think we can draw strength from past research with BIPOC communities, right? Which have looked to history, which have tried to trace pathways. We can see if those pathways might or might not be operating in predominantly white communities. 
Um, I think in Appalachia in particular, it's really essential to dramatically expand research on the impact of the war on drugs, um, given the size of the opioid epidemic there, um, given the kind of prominence of the war on drugs in that area. Here, we only looked at one health outcome, actually a health services outcome. Things may be very different from other, for other health outcomes. And I wanna recognize that not all residents of rural Appalachia are white, right? In fact, the 10% that we excluded from this analysis, many of them were from the Eastern band of the Cherokee Indians, right? And so we didn't have enough people in the sample to really understand their experiences with um, the criminal legal system, their experiences with unmet need for care or how those two things might be related. But I suspect things might be quite different. So future research, I think, really has to be oversampling those populations. Um, and uh, I think I'll stop here.